I was a bad kid. And no, I'm not talking about your regular teenage delinquency like trying cigarettes, school detentions, or getting bad grades. I mean, really bad. By age 17, I was shoplifting, stealing cars, getting picked up by cops for all sorts of things. Not exactly hurting anyone, but I was a constant headache for my mom and dad. Then after me and dad almost got into an actual fistfight, he kicked me out of the house. I know I deserved it, and I know they figured I'd just go stay with friends for a couple of days because that's exactly what I did. But, me being me, I quickly wore out my welcome at my buddies' houses and ran out of places to stay. But again, me being me, I was way too proud to just go home and apologize. Since it was summertime, I figured it'd be a good idea to head down to the park to find somewhere to sleep. Now, I lived in the inner city back then, so there was a bunch of other actual homeless people already sleeping there, and as soon as I realized I was actually stuck out there for a night, I started to realize that this homeless thing wasn't a game anymore. As it started to get really late, I got to the park at around 11pm and it was like 1am by the time this happened. One of the homeless dudes walked up to me as I started to bed down on the bench and started talking to me. He asked what I was doing and... Being naive, I told him, I'm homeless. He immediately responded by saying, no you're not, and pretty much guessed the whole deal about me having a falling out with my mom and dad. I didn't want to admit that he was exactly right, so I just kept my mouth shut, but I remember him saying something like, really though kid, if you have kin, you need to pay him a visit because I promise you ain't ready for this life. My pride kept me out there for three whole nights, and every single time I curled up on that bench, the same old homeless dude would walk up and be like, Go home, kid. This ain't you. In hindsight, he was exactly right, but at the time, he was just another person to prove wrong. My final night on the streets also happened to be the first that I tried to ingratiate myself with the homeless folk who slept in the park, partially out of boredom, partially out of hunger. I'd run out of money, run out of food, and I figured if I hung out with the other guys I could maybe get in on some of their food or something. I asked around, but no one had any spares, until I asked this one guy and he told me to buzz off, and I noticed a Snickers bar sticking out of his coat pocket. My rumbling stomach basically just overrode my brain and, with all the dexterity of a Victorian pickpocket, I slid the thing out of his pocket and walked off. Not my proudest moment stealing food from a homeless guy when I could have just swallowed my pride and walked home, but it is what it is. So, I go off to hide somewhere so I can devour the Snickers whole, then I walk back to where the other guys are to hang out some more. Maybe like two or three hours later, I'm still trying to ingratiate myself with the homeless guys, but I'm also still pretty nervous around them, for obvious reasons. I figured the guy I stole from is too drunk to even notice that I stole from him, but oh boy was I wrong about that. Because like I said, a few hours after I stole it, I noticed the guy began to tap his coat pocket, obviously noticing that the candy bar is gone. I'm trying to remain inconspicuous, but I'm also trying to keep my eye on the guy because if he put two and two together and worked out that it was me that stole from him, I wanted enough warning to be able to get out of there. So the guy taps his pocket and when he stops, I can see the cogs turning in his booze-soaked brain as I figured he was thinking, hmm, pretty sure I had some candy in there. But then a few seconds later, he's back taking poles from his 40 ounce like he'd completely forgotten about the whole thing. Only, he hadn't. And the most shocking thing about what came next was how it went from zero to a hundred in like a second flat. So remember that pole of his 40? He takes one, then two, then a third, much longer one, almost like he was trying to polish the whole thing off in a hurry. Which, as it turned out, was exactly what he was doing. Because what was once an innocent beverage receptacle soon became a weapon. When he turned to the guy to his right and sent the glass 40 bottles smashing into his face. The guy just collapsed, hands covering his face. Same hands with muffled blood-curdling screams that he let out. The guy I stole from then started kicking the life out of him. Steal from me? Steal from me, mother effer? And out of all the homeless people there, only one actually tried to break it up. And even then, it was just a slurred, They break it up over there. 
which ended up being totally ignored. I remember turning to the older dude had been nice to me, telling me to go home and whatnot, and I feigned ignorance as I asked him what was going on. The guy said the dude getting beat down was always stealing stuff, so if anything went missing around the park, it was most probably his fault. No one cared, though. No one gave a single worry that this guy was getting his face stomped on, and it was all my fault. Oh, and I mean stomped on. I could hear this guy's face literally crunching under the guy's boot. I knew I should have said something. I know I should have owned up, but believe me when I tell you that I've never been that scared. Not before or after. All I could think of was, if I tell the truth, that'll be my face getting stamped on, only it'll probably be like a hundred times worse because, well, look what I caused. I turned to the nice guy and was like, but what if he didn't steal it? What if someone else stole it? The guy looked at me and his eyes went all wide and he leaned in and said, Don't say a word, kid. Just leave. Leave and never, ever come back. As I walked away, I could still hear the guy getting his butt beat, and although I never found out what happened to him, I don't see anyone being able to survive the kind of head injuries he got. That very same night, maybe at around 2am, I walked back to my parents' house and banged on the front door until my dad woke up and answered. I just blurted out this big, long apology about being a total idiot and not appreciating what I'd had. I'm pleased to say that that was the first step on the road to being a decent human being, because almost everything I did before that had little to no consequences, or rather, what little there were didn't bother me. But that night I stole the candy bar, I actually saw how bad the repercussions could be, and honestly, I had no idea they could ever be that bad, just for taking a candy bar. I feel equal parts shame and horror when I look back on it, my pride and greed caused me to do something shameful and my cowardice might have cost a relatively innocent man's life. I wish it had never happened, but at the same time, if it didn't, who knows, I might be still hanging out in that park today, if I'd even be alive at all. This happened to me when I was 13 years old. I was a nerd. Studies were always my first priority. It was a sunny Monday afternoon when I returned home from school. I saw my parents getting ready for a party. My mum asked if I would join them. My answer was a big no because I had a math test, so I went upstairs to my room to start studying. After about half an hour later, my brother came to my room and told me that they were leaving. I closed the door and waved them goodbye through my window, and then closed the curtains. About 45 minutes later, there was a knock on my door. I got spooked at first, then I thought I heard my mom telling me that the party got cancelled. She told me to come and have dinner with them. I denied. She repeated the question three times in every 15 minutes. The third time I told her to stop and I was going to bed. After that, I went to sleep. At around midnight, my mom came into my room. I woke up from her silent footsteps, then I apologized for shouting at her earlier. She was confused and told me that they returned just 15 minutes ago. I started panicking. My mom tried to calm me down and stayed next to me for the night. At around 2am, there was the same knock on my door, telling me the same thing but this time, furiously. I said enough was enough. I got up and I was about to open the door, but me and my mom froze. There were fighting sounds coming from the house, and when I opened the door, a woman with shabby clothes, a white face and a long hair was hitting my dad. My mom went ahead to call the police, but the woman catched my mom by her hair and threw her downstairs. She then took out a knife and stabbed me. I fell unconscious after that. When I opened my eyes again, I was in a hospital. My mom told me that my brother threw his skateboard at her head, and she fell unconscious. They then called the police and an ambulance. The police reported that she was a famous mimicry artist. Apparently one day, she lost all her wealth and lost her mind. After losing her reputation and wealth, she started murdering people. I still remember her face.
My name is Madison, and I am a 22-year-old woman. And this is a story that happened to me 11 years ago. I was an average 11-year-old, living comfortably in a two-story house. We lived near a lake that had a park in front of it, that I would always go play on. The walk wasn't far, maybe a five-minute walk. I knew the area well, and the people living in it, so my mom didn't have a problem with me walking there. Every time I would walk there, I would notice a man sitting on a bench, smiling at me. I didn't know his name, so for the sake of the story not being confusing, let's call him Mike. I was always creeped out by him because he would just sit there and watch me. I also noticed that he drove there and didn't live close by, which was odd because the park was closed off and only the people that lived in my area knew about it. He would always keep an eye on me when I walked home too. One day I was going to the park and another man that I had seen before started following me. He began walking behind me every time I went to the park and home. I stopped going to the park because of that, but I eventually got bored. I lived on the second story of my house and had a window in my bedroom leading to the roof. When I was bored I would just go on top of the roof, which my mother always told me was dangerous and I could fall. This one time not long after I stopped going to the park, I saw the same man that would follow me outside my house's fence checking out my home, and Mike was standing close behind him. The man saw me and tried to jump the gate. I ran downstairs and called for my mom to call the cops. He was now at my front door banging on it. The front door had a big window so we could see that the man was banging on it with a knife in his hands. My mom stayed on the phone with the cops and I saw Mike running towards our house and jumping the gate. Mike tackled that man and eventually knocked him out. We later found out that he kidnapped over five young girls in our area and killed them. Mike would always watch because he noticed that man before me and wanted to make sure that I was safe. I am forever grateful for Mike because without him, I probably wouldn't be here today. This happened to me back in the summer of 2015. The bus and the metro were always crowded with people and it was kind of uncomfortable for me. So I would get a taxi to go to my school. On top of that, for personal reasons, I felt the taxi was a safer option for me. Until that year. I woke up at 6am as usual. After picking up my lunch bag, I said goodbye to my mom and sister and ran towards the taxi. As soon as I got inside, I immediately sensed that something was a bit off. The taxi driver was a middle-aged man, maybe around his 50s. He had markings all over his skin and wide open eyes. And I could see his mouth was full of scratches. He even looked and smelled like he didn't take a shower for a long time. Although all of his behavior gave me goosebumps, I tried to ignore it. He then started driving his car so fast that I felt like someone was chasing him. While he was driving frantically, he tried to talk to me about school, but I kept giving him short answers. When we were finally close to the school, he didn't slow down and I was terrified. Finally, I realized that this man is not fit to be a driver at all. I opened the window and desperately screamed for help. All of a sudden, he took his pocket knife out and stabbed me in the leg. I felt a sharp pain in my leg, but didn't stop yelling for help. I don't remember when, but I passed out. When I woke up again, I was still in the same car, but the driver wasn't there anymore. I could see police cars and cops around the taxi. It turns out that some of my classmates saw me in the taxi getting far away from school, so they ended up calling 911. And the police ran after his car and eventually arrested him. After the commotion, the ambulance took me to a hospital with my mom and sister by my side. My leg was in a horrible condition that I needed surgery, so I had to stay for a week in the hospital. To this day, I still got the scar on my leg. And whenever I think of that incident, my heart drops. I wonder what would have happened to me if my classmates didn't see me in the taxi that day. When I was 11 years old, my dad took me and my sisters to this very nice house in the middle of nowhere. It was very scary and the neighbors had a weird vibe. When night fell, I looked out the window and I could see a scary old lady with her face all bloody right in front of my window looking at me. 
she was making crying baby noises. I brushed it off as my dad or my sisters playing a prank on me. The next day when I was going to bed, I saw the same lady, but this time in my room. I screamed, but she grabbed me. I was able to run to the bathroom. My dad and my sisters couldn't hear my screams. I thought I was going to die, but I had my phone with me which barely had any signal. And my 911 call was keep breaking off. But thankfully, the police came. They took down the woman, handcuffed her. Later they told us that the woman is a child predator. And apparently she was living in my dad's shed. And none of us realized it. You may not realize that there is a world that you're not even aware of. After all, the earth is still not a place that has been fully discovered. I used to love traveling. A year ago, I left for the Amazon, driven by passion. Me and the crew that I was in were excited to make a special documentary film, exploring remote areas. But the things that I saw, that thing that I saw, you have to understand that I can't describe how terrifying that, that thing was. I was lucky to be alive. I don't know how I survived, or how I came back home. My memories, they were all gone. I barely recovered from my wounds. After that, I had psychotherapies as well as medical treatments, and through those I was able to recover my lost memory. It was day 10 of the expeditions in the Amazon. We kept going deeper into the forest. The Amazonian Indians in the area told us strongly not to go deeper. So we decided to dispatch only three out of the ten members of the crew to the place. And as you can guess, I was one of the three. The rest remained in the village. And it was us three, walking deeper into the jungle. The environment was just like a sci-fi movie. Full of enormous trees, plants and huge insects. In that majestic nature, it felt like I was going back to the Mesozoic era. It was fantastic. At least, up until that moment. As we went deeper, the plants and insects around us got bigger and bigger. And Mark, one of the members, became agitated. He said he wanted to turn back, but me and Victor persuaded him to keep going. We had a goal at that time, to film this documentary and make history with our findings. It wasn't just Mark. We all knew that it was dangerous, but there was no wondering why he freaked out that much. Because there were fist-sized insects and humongous snakes wandering around us. I was holding a big machete, so did Victor, but for no avail. None of us could see beyond our noses because of the plants. After walking for a long time, we finally reached the swamp. There we saw a massive alligator. I was freaked out, but the excitement filled its place. While I was staring at the alligator, I noticed Mark was having a panic attack. He couldn't even catch his breath. It seemed like he was going to have a heart attack, overwhelmed with extreme fear. He kept mumbling, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, we're gonna die. Although, even if the alligator would attack us, we could defend ourselves since we not only had machetes, but guns too. But fortunately, it didn't even move the muscle. It was just staring at us. So we kept moving forward. What happened after that is the real stuff of horrors. Looking back on this now, that was just unbelievable. It was only then when I heard a loud bang of a gun and screaming. I realized I got knocked down and my head was in the mud. I began to feel an immense pain within my body and I realized my arm was broken. The camera that I was holding were also completely destroyed. It was too painful for me to even move an inch. Right there and then, I heard the most frightening screams of a creature that I had never heard before. That ear-splitting sound made me imagine how massive that being could be. It was so tremendous that it echoed through the entire forest. I barely raised my head and turned towards the sound, and I saw Victor shooting his gun at something. At first glance, I couldn't recognize it clearly because my vision was blurry due to dizziness. But as it got clearer, I saw what it was. A green, 
giant insect. It was a mantis. A giant mantis. It seemed to be almost nine feet tall. I still couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was probably hit by that mantis and flown away, fell into the mud. Mark was nowhere to be seen, and Victor was firing his gun frantically, but it didn't even phase the mantis. Suddenly, it rushed at Victor and violently stabbed his neck, and I saw Victor's head flying away in front of my eyes. After the death of Victor, the mantis slowly raised its head, looking at me. When we were staring at each other, I was paralyzed by fear. I still don't forget those eyes. They were just as big as a human's head, and I could see myself reflected through them. The mantis screeched in a very high pitch. I thought it was gonna kill me, but it didn't. It just flew off. I couldn't breathe due to fear, and even felt suffocated. When I got myself together, I heard a voice. Help me. It sounded very feeble, but I knew it was Mark's voice. I started searching for him, following his weak cries of help, and found him stuck under a large tree, waist down. The place was completely devastated. It was like a battlefield. Everything was destroyed. Mark was barely breathing. I tried helping him get him out under that tree, but my broken arm didn't let me. Mark and I looked at each other. He stared at me, no hope in his eyes, and closed them. With teary eyes, I started to walk away. I kept moving, hearing the distant screeches of the monster. After hours of walking, I finally got back to the village where the crew resided. They were sitting, and when they saw me, the open wounds on my head and my broken arm, they got up, rushing towards me, and then I collapsed. It was at that moment I lost my memories. They apparently wanted to go look for the others, but the chief of the tribe didn't allow them to go. Being unconscious, I couldn't tell them what happened to me, to Mark, or to Victor. They then gathered the equipment and patched me up the best way they could, and we left the Amazon to go back home. I wish these memories stay that way. Now that I have them back, I can't fall asleep. And even if I do, I wake up drenched in sweat. The death of those people right in front of my eyes haunts me. And that scream. It will be the end of me. This story happened very recently when my cousin came to visit me and my family. We had so much fun until he came into my room, leaving the door open, and we were alone in there. Just to give you an idea of how my house is shaped, my room is connected to the living room, and the living room is connected to my parents' room. The kitchen is within the living room since our house is small. Now let's get back to the story. Everything started when I had to take my medication and lay in my bed to relax. My cousin was acting normally at first, playing with me and the toys in my room, but after 10 minutes of me taking the medication, he started acting weird. At first he was just screaming. After all, he is a four-year-old, so he can't really speak. I thought it was because I was just laying there, watching onesie videos on my phone. But then he started biting me really hard on my hand. I warned him that I would punish him if he ever do that again, but he did something more sinister. He got on my back and started to strangle me. I was confused. He is a sweet child who've always been so kind to me. He always kissed me and hugged me, but now this was happening. Of course, my first reaction was to punch him in the elbow so that he would stop what he was doing. When he stopped, we looked at each other and I saw his eyes filled with anger and hatred towards me. He whispered something which I couldn't hear, but then, all of a sudden, he started hugging me and playing with me. After about two hours, he and his parents left, but this story doesn't end here. Earlier today, my grandmother invited us, my cousin, and his parents to our house. 
We got there, laughed and played. After that, me and my cousin decided to play hide and seek and he was the seeker in the first round. He started counting and I hid in my grandfather's room behind the door. The room is small and there is a light switch right where I hid and next to the place that I hid is a wooden desk. So I was hiding there and after a while he found me. The next round I was the seeker. Since he is four years old, he would gasp or chuckle when I got near him, which would give out his position. But I always acted like I didn't know where he was. And I did the exact same thing today. When I learned where I was hiding, I went to the other side of the house where I hid before, just to play along. While I was walking, I looked through the window of the place where I hid, because he was able to see me through there. But what I saw in my grandfather's room shocked me. There was a girl sitting down with her hair in front of her face. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I brushed it off as being my imagination, because the day before that I watched the horror movie Ring. Immediately after that, I went back and got him out of the place he was hiding. We stopped playing hide and seek because of that girl, and went directly to the living room. While sitting, he got distracted by something. I followed his gaze, but saw nothing. He then walked towards the place he was looking at, and after about 15 seconds, he came back screaming. He was scared by something, and I feel like I know what that thing was. The adults wanted to know why he was screaming, but I just told them that he was probably bored, putting the pieces together. I think I know what's going on. I think my cousin is somehow possessed by that girl. We both saw that girl, I, I know we did. That is the reason why he was screaming. I just hope nothing happens to him. And I hope that girl will leave him alone. The happiest couple I've ever met the couple to give hope to anyone who didn't believe in love, came crashing down from their happy, cloudless blue sky. And it all began with an old, bitter woman. I arrived at JC's house 5pm sharp. She's always obsessing with time, questioning why you're a minute late or a minute early, as if she's a detective and you're in her interrogation room. A young woman with pitch black hair, dark clothing, a nose ring and a few tattoos to go with it all. Her home decorated not too differently from herself, with pumpkins sitting on the porch in September, black wind chimes and a very welcoming rug at the doorstep that reads, leave now. <laughs> I felt special being the only person she trusted. Still it took me a few knocks and even a reluctant ring of the doorbell to get her to answer. Hey, I began ending the awkward stare down she always initiated when that door opened. Ralph, she said smiling. How you doing? Good? Good? Yourself? She took a moment to trace the floor with her left foot. Good. JC and I had planned a movie night. Well, as long as the movie wasn't too long, as she never allows anyone, even me, inside her home after 9.30pm. My nostrils were introduced to a scent of fresh batch of cinnamon cookies. I had hoped that they were for me, for us, but... JC brought back a bowl of popcorn and soda for the movie instead, which was fine. I certainly wasn't going to complain and then end up losing her trust for the next two decades. The movie ended. We thought Halloween too was okay. I gave myself a little tour while JC went upstairs to find another movie. I was glad she was willing to watch another, that she was beginning to open up and let her friends back into her life. I guess the boredom from all the loneliness she has been experiencing the past few years finally got to her. My eye caught a picture framed above the fireplace of JC and her ex-boyfriend, Tyler. No one knows what happened between them. All we know is that one day they were together and the next day they weren't. After the breakup, Tyler simply disappeared and no one's seen him since. And the aftermath shows. It shows in JC's eyes. Saw 4? JC waved the DVD from atop the stairs, awaiting my response. Sure. Somehow, over and despite the gore of Soul 4, she slowly drifted into a deep sleep. I wasn't really paying much attention to the movie anyway, 
so that was fine. And it was about time for me to leave soon. I made myself over to the kitchen for a glass of water. I noticed the time, 9.15pm. I thought I'd better get going soon, even if JC wasn't going to wake up in the next 15 minutes. I told myself I would wake her up before I left out of respect for her rules. I noticed a tray of cinnamon cookies on the counter and figured she wouldn't notice one missing anyway. I looked down the hallway before turning the sink on to see if JC is still asleep. I didn't want to make too much of a noise washing my hands, but it wasn't the sound of running water that woke her up. It was my scream. As I washed my hands, I made out a face of a man in the window in front of the sink. I jumped back in shock, with JC running into the kitchen with questions. What? What happened? She demanded to know. Call the cops. I think someone tried to break into her house. I, I saw him through the window by the sink. What did he look like? I don't, I don't know. I, definitely a man though. I, I think he was white. She burst out in a sudden laughter. No more movies tonight, Ralph. Time to go. She didn't believe me or she wasn't taking it seriously. I, I'm not leaving here. You're not staying here alone. I'll be fine. Not happening. I sternly interrupted. JC finally noticed the time. Her expression suddenly turned serious and she uncrossed her arms. Oh, no, Ralph, you have to go, you have to go, now. I poked my head to the side, looking out the kitchen. I saw the same men through the living room window this time. Holy shit, call the cops, he's right there. Jason looked back. She saw him too. A very loud and violent bang against the door rumbled throughout the house. She ran for the front door to make sure it was locked. Except, she actually ran to the front door so I wouldn't look through the peephole. Move! What are you doing? We gotta see this guy's face so we can describe him. Ralph. What? Move! Ralph, please. Confusion hit me. Why won't you move, JC? Tears run down her face, followed by trails of black eyeshadow. She seemed hopeless, like she had just given up, like she was finally ready to tell me something. Ralph, do you remember that old woman? The one... Tyler and I, she dried her face with her sweater. The one me and Tyler visited. Yeah, okay, what about her? JC and Tyler were as open-minded as they come. They dipped their toes into diverse pools of knowledge. Knowledge in religion, culture, science, you name it. They studied Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, and anything else that sparked their interest. Which is why, at the request of a former friend, they decided to meet with a woman who claimed to possess certain abilities. A very old, serious, grey-haired woman whose shoulders almost met the back of her neck. This woman lived up in the mountains, in absolute isolation. Although open-minded and always willing to listen, JC and Tyler couldn't help but laugh at the woman who claimed to be one of the last people on earth who knew how to practice real witchcraft. The woman did not react mercifully at their mocking, and supposedly proved to JC and Tyler that she was in fact very real. It was a running joke that JC would tell us from time to time, even when Tyler left. They broke up immediately after meeting that old woman, but no one thought that it was their reasoning. JC! JC! She looked up at me, still leaning against the door. What about the woman? What the hell does she have to do with anything that's happening right now? The tears started again. Then, another very, very loud bang against the door. It was so strong that it rattled the locks and even shook some picture frames on the wall out of place. Holy shit! Okay, JC, move, please! I moved her away from the door to look through the peephole. Ralph, please. I saw the stuff of nightmares. A man on the ground, standing on all fours. That is, standing on his legs and hands. His crooked head looking up at the door, shifting fast. Shifting inhumanely fast. His eyes were pitch black, like JC's hair. And he was completely naked, with his ribcage poking against his skin. He was standing so close to the door that I was able to see every little detail. Then he, or it, opened its mouth to reveal cat-like teeth. 
I jumped back as it began to bang its head against the door again. I looked at JC, waiting for an explanation. She just looked back at me, as if expecting me to figure out myself, like I was supposed to know. Then she ran to the kitchen, and she came back with a tray of cinnamon cookies she had baked earlier. She placed her hand on the doorknob and looked at me. They're still his favorite. What are you doing? Don't open the door! She opened the door and walked outside, closing it behind herself. I looked through the people, then run to the living room to get a better look through the window. She was feeding it the cookies and petting it on the head. It rubbed against her legs. She kissed it on its forehead while it consumed everything she placed in front of it. Then, in a sight that made me jump back from the window, it suddenly ran off into the woods, moving incredibly fast. I just stared at JC as she walked back inside. She froze by the staircase, still waiting for me to say something. By then, it just hit me. Tyler always did like those cookies. So, I'm a big horror fangirl. I'm 20 years old and over the past year, I've been collecting from the figures to the mask to even life size. I won't say this story was terrifying or anything, but to me, it basically saved me. I'll try and make it simple. I'm a big Michael Myers fan, and last October I bought a life-size figure of him. Oh, and a Chucky doll too. And not just one of the cheap ones, the replica looking ones. Some may call me crazy, but what's not to love about horror, right? I keep everything stored away at the moment, apart from the life-size Michael, which he stands around six foot. He's not a cheap looking guy either. He looks like the real deal. The replica mask, real coveralls with blood, and even a knife too. He stands in my room right next to my bed. And even though it used to creep me out seeing a dark black figure in my room, I eventually got used to it. Like to the point where I actually felt comfortable around him. I don't move him anywhere else though, as nobody in the house really liked him. Anyway, now that that's all out of the way, here's the thing that happened. So last year when I received him, I was home alone watching films downstairs when I then heard a thud upstairs. I froze as I didn't really know what to think. I slowly got up and went up to my room and then instantly heard the thuds from the downstairs door. I had absolutely no clue what the hell was going on because I was the only one there. I quietly sat in the dark as I didn't keep the lights on and I listened. I heard what sounded like men talking, and then I realized someone had came in, and that I didn't lock the door. The TV was also left on, so they had to have known I was there. Anyways though, there I was sitting face to face with the Michael figure in the dark. I heard the footsteps coming up the stairs to my room, while I sat in the corner with my head spinning. I felt like I wanted to pass out. I even started to sweat a little. My door then opened and there I'd seen a hooded figure walk in and head straight towards me. He had something in his hand, something sharp, like a pocket knife. I was leaning against the cold wall more and more, wanting to grab something, until out of nowhere, Michael's arm then started moving. Bear in mind it was still dark, so this guy had no clue that Michael was behind him until he heard it move. I also want to add that it wasn't an electrical noise. It was the material of the arm rubbing together. The man then turned around and instantly yelled. And I mean, I've never seen a man run so fast in his life. The man then started yelling, go, get the hell out of here, to some other guy that was in a van outside. I stood up and watched them as they drove off. I then noticed a crack in my window. Obviously these freaks were throwing rocks in my window, possibly to distract me, but I didn't care about that. I turned around and just stared at Michael because I really had no clue that he could even move. I started investigating and then realized he was an animatronic the entire time. But I was thinking he moved just at that exact moment and basically saved my life that night. I can even laugh about it now because of how scared the guy was. I got my window repaired and did mention to the police that I had a break in, but there was really nothing they could do about it. But it was still reported just in case they tried anywhere else. Luckily nothing was taken, as there was really nothing valuable downstairs. Obviously this Michael Myers looks like a real person, and anyone that looks at it, especially in the dark, gets the creeps by it. 
I know it sounds insane and maybe even funny, but this incident really happened and I'm so damn thankful that I have him in my room. I never even once thought it would save my life like this, especially if he never moved. I always wonder how he moved anyway. I mean, it happened all by itself. Was it some kind of coincidence? I'll never know, but thank you, Michael. God only knows what that guy would have done to me if you weren't here. Twenty-one-year-old Samantha Josephson grew up in Robbinsville, New Jersey as the daughter of Seymour and Marcy Josephson. While majoring in political science at the University of South Carolina, Samantha studied abroad in Barcelona and planned on attending the Drexel University School of Law after her 2019 graduation. Samantha was a girl who showed boundless potential, who was potentially looking at a partial scholarship to Rutgers, but all her dreams would be snuffed out after making just one fatal mistake. On the evening of March 28, 2019, Samantha went out drinking with friends at the Bird Dog Bar in downtown Columbia. At around 2 a.m., they decided to call it a night, and like so many of us have done before, Samantha pulled out her phone and ordered an Uber. Just nine minutes later, surveillance footage from the Bird Dog shows a black Chevrolet Impala pulling up outside. Samantha steps outside, enters the vehicle, and greets her driver. The man at the wheel was named Nathaniel Rowland. And although he didn't say anything as Samantha climbed into his car, he hadn't actually been expecting a passenger. You see, the car that Samantha had climbed into wasn't her Uber. It was just a similar looking vehicle she'd drunkenly mistaken for her ride. He'd expect Roland to ultimately tell her to get out of the car, but he didn't. He simply engaged the locks, trapping Samantha inside, then drove off. It's not clear whether or not Samantha realized her mistake before Roland stopped the vehicle, but at some point, Roland parked up his Impala, pulled out a knife, and inflicted a sustained and savage attack upon the terrified Samantha. Using a bizarre-looking two-bladed knife, Roland proceeded to stab Samantha 120 times. She attempted to shield herself, but she was trapped, and Roland was armed. As well as several horrific defensive wounds, Roland also stabbed Josephson in the head with so much force that the knife went through her skull to her brain. But the killer blow seems to have come when he stabbed her in the carotid, one of two main arteries that carries blood to the brain. Samantha also sustained wounds to her face, neck, shoulder, torso, back, lung, leg, and feet, bleeding out within just 10 to 15 minutes. Roland then dumped Samantha's body in the New Zion field, where she was discovered by a handful of local turkey hunters. The following morning, Samantha's roommates became deeply concerned when they found she hadn't returned home. Police rushed into action, easily tracing her last known whereabouts to the Bird Dog Bar and to Nathaniel Roland's black Chevy Impala. Officers later happened across Roland while he was out driving, and after a traffic stop was attempted, Roland jumped out of the stationary vehicle and began to flee. Inside his car, police officers found a container of liquid bleach, germicidal wipes, and a bottle of window cleaner. But perhaps the most incriminating piece of evidence was Samantha's phone, which Roland had foolishly chosen to keep. He was arrested, questioned, and tissue samples were taken. Disturbingly, the tissues under Roland's nails tested positive for Samantha's DNA meaning whatever he was doing after he'd killed her, it had been rigorous enough for particles of her skin to become embedded under his nails. Roland was soon charged with Samantha's kidnap and murder, and it became apparent that Samantha wasn't his first kidnapping victim. He had apparently carjacked a woman at the stoplight in October of 2018, and was extremely violent in the commission of the crime, beating her and threatening her, before they drove to an ATM to almost empty her bank account. In July of 2021, Roland was found guilty of kidnapping and murdering, with a judge sentencing him to life in prison. The same judge, a veteran of the legal circuit, said the murder was perhaps the most heartless and severe he'd ever seen, denying Roland's request for leniency. It's also easy to see why. Roland displayed some horrifying predatory behavior. 
when a stranger accidentally climbs into their car, most correct thinking people simply laugh it off, perhaps getting a little prickly if they're in a bad mood. But Roland found a stranger climbing into his back seat, and his first thoughts were nothing short of bloodthirsty. Samantha Josephson made an honest and simple mistake, and Nathaniel Roland made her pay with her life. A little bit of context. I'm a 27 year old female and I live alone with my dog. I purchased my home in December of 2019, so I'm still a bit new to the neighborhood. My neighbor to the left of me is a sweet old man named Leo, and we really get along quite well. We were chatting one afternoon and he was giving me the inside scoop on all of the neighbors. He was the first house on the block, so he knows pretty much everything about everyone. When we got to talking about the man who lives on the right side of me, let's call him Tom. Well, Leo seemed to become hesitant. Leo then said, Well, you know that Tom was involved with that group that murdered that librarian, right? Obviously very confused, I told Leo that I wasn't really sure what he meant, and I asked him what happened. I'm not sure if Leo just regretted telling me in that moment, or if his hearing is just bad and he didn't hear my question. Regardless, he immediately changed the subject, and I didn't dare pressure him to elaborate. After our conversation, I thought about the little that I know about Tom. He's tall with graying hair and seems to keep to himself. When I first moved in, I was honestly a bit concerned for him because I never saw any lights on in his home. Every single blind was pulled down consistently, and his old truck rarely ever left his driveway. He's also the only one on our street with a privacy fence surrounding his backyard. Total red flags looking back now. Later that night, I decided to do a bit of research, trying to figure out what Leo had mentioned. And well, it didn't really take long for me to stumble across the news article. One of the most gruesome murders in the county, it read. I read articles upon articles and full court documents all about the violent murder of a middle-aged woman. It turns out that when Tom was a young adult living in the next county over, he and his friend attempted to rob a neighbor by breaking into her home during the daytime, but she unfortunately caught them in the act. Instead of fleeing the scene, however, Tom's friend then knocked her out cold with a bottle. Afterwards, Tom beat her skull in with a baseball bat. The friend slit her wrists. The men then stole her car and were later arrested after they ended up crashing it due to icy road conditions. When the deceased woman's son came home from school, he said that his mother looked completely unrecognizable. Tom's lawyers tried to plead insanity with the help from his family, who put forth evidence of Tom's erratic behavior as a child, even once pulling a knife on his own mother. Although the insanity plea was unsuccessful, Tom still ended up serving a pitiful amount of time in prison for what I see as the most disturbing role in the murder. Tom's friend was released in 2016. They didn't receive life sentences because of some weird discrepancy with the initial robbery being done during the daytime and not at night, which is absolutely ridiculous and shows just how crooked our criminal justice system really is. After finding all of this out, I've only had one interaction with Tom. I was going to take the trash out, and his dog, who was chained up in front of his house, then lunged at me while barking like crazy. Tom came and took the dog and apologized. I absolutely love dogs, and I wasn't upset by this, and I told him it was totally fine. Not that I would have argued with him anyways. I've interned in a jail before, and I've had conversations with inmates who were on trial for murder, so I'm not necessarily intimidated easily. And I do believe in the possibility for a criminal to reintegrate into society and then be successful after proper therapy. But something about a convicted murderer living directly next to you just really hits different. When I was 11 years old, my dad took me and my sisters to this very nice house in the middle of nowhere. It was very scary and the neighbors had a weird vibe. When night fell, 
I looked out the window and I could see a scary old lady with her face, all bloody, right in front of my window, looking at me. She was making crying baby noises. I brushed it off as my dad or my sisters playing a prank on me. The next day when I was going to bed, I saw the same lady, but this time in my room. I screamed, but she grabbed me. I was able to run to the bathroom. My dad and my sisters couldn't hear my screams. I thought I was going to die, but I had my phone with me which barely had any signal. And my 911 call was keep breaking off. But thankfully, the police came. They took down the woman, handcuffed her. Later they told us that the woman is a child predator. And apparently she was living in my dad's shed. And none of us realized it. This wasn't my first paranormal experience, but I can say that this story is one of the most horrifying experiences I've had. It was back in September of 2010. My grandma was diagnosed with stage 3 breast cancer. It was Sunday when I first encountered this lady wearing a black gown. I was home alone at the time, since our family goes to my uncle's farm every Sunday. My brother and I were raised by our grandma and aunt. I was reading a book. My bedroom's door was open. I could see the living room outside and the screen door that leads to our garage. Suddenly, I felt a cold wind that seemed to surround me within my room. That wasn't normal, as our AC wasn't on, and all the windows in our house, including those in my room, were all completely shut. I looked into the living room, and there I saw her the lady wearing a black gown. She looked to be around her 40s, and I just couldn't believe what I was seeing, so I froze and I stared at her. She wasn't looking at me. She seemed to be walking. No, no, she seemed more like she was floating. She proceeded to go through the living room door that led to the garage. I didn't yet tell anyone in our family what I encountered that day since they've always been skeptic and didn't believe in the paranormal. Little did I know, that was the day that started my sleepless nights. My grandma's bed was soon moved to that living room, since she liked watching the TV there until she went to sleep. The main bathroom is also more accessible there. So whenever I'd wake up late at night to go to the bathroom, I would turn off the television for her if she was sleeping. It's always been just me and her at the house during those times, since my brother stayed at our aunt's house, which was just beside ours. That first night after seeing the lady, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom, and I turned off my grandma's TV like I always do. When I was on my way back to my room, I passed my grandma's bed, and that's when I noticed there was a woman standing next to her bed. It was the lady wearing a black gown, the same one from before. She was just standing there. It seemed like she was guarding my grandma. She wasn't even looking at me. I got so scared, I rushed and went to my room and locked my door. I slept with the light on that night. The following night, I told my grandma that I was going to sleep beside her that night. I was scared that this lady would do something to hurt her. She asked me why, so I simply said I wanted to sleep beside her like I did when I was a kid, and she agreed. My grandma fell asleep, so I turned off the TV. I didn't get enough sleep the night before, so I fell asleep too, but it didn't last long. I woke up, and there she was, standing next to my grandma's bed but with a bit of distance this time. I panicked, but I didn't want to wake my grandma, so I ran to my room, turning on the light, but I left the door open to make sure nothing happened to my grandma, just in case. Days passed, and I still had sleepless nights. I always felt that there was someone inside my room with me, but there wasn't anyone there. The woman wearing a black gown was always guarding my grandma, standing next to her bed every single night. 
Weeks passed, and she would still be there. One day, my aunt hired a nanny for my grandma to help her with her needs. My aunt requested that she slept on the couch near my grandma's bed for a few nights, so she did. I couldn't help but worry about her, so I told her of my encounters with the woman in the black gown. Of course, she didn't take me too seriously and told me, it's just your imagination, since I was 16 years old at the time. I didn't say anything more and just left her to her business. The next day, morning came, and we were about to have breakfast. I saw the nanny, and she looked as if she didn't get any sleep. She looked at me and said, I, I saw her. She seemed to be very scared. She asked my aunt if she could go home every night to sleep at their house instead. When my aunt asked why, the nanny replied she couldn't sleep well at our house, so my aunt obliged. My days stayed the same. The lady in the black gown was still there, and I wouldn't get any sleep at all. I think I even got sick due to lack of sleep. I was also in high school at the time, so it was hard for me. One morning, I was having breakfast with my aunt, and she asked how I was doing. She said that I looked sick, so I spilled everything. I told her about the woman wearing a black gown, standing next to Grandma's bed every single night. This time, she looked like she was convinced. She knew I was someone who loved to sleep, someone who rarely got sick. Grandma came to have breakfast with us, and she looked annoyed. My aunt asked what was up, and my grandma looked at me and said, Why were you going inside and out the living room to go to the bathroom last night? I couldn't sleep, and you wouldn't listen when I asked you to stop. My aunt and I looked at each other. My aunt was shocked. I hadn't gone to the bathroom last night, since I felt really sick. So who was it? I didn't tell this to grandma, so I simply apologized. Months passed, and I got used to the apparition, since she really didn't do any harm, and I didn't want it to affect my lifestyle anymore. The strange thing was, I still had this feeling that there was someone in my room with me, and that feeling would not go away, and something told me that energy wasn't the same energy that came from the lady in black. Every time I tried to sleep or close my eyes, even for a second, I felt as if there was going to be a face right in front of mine, so I always tried to stay awake. It was terrible. I was getting very sick, so my brother decided that he'll sleep on the couch next to my grandma for the next months. He was a cat lover and brought all six of his cats with him, which we all loved dearly. That night, I bid him and my grandma good night and closed my door. I fell asleep right away, but after a few minutes, I woke up with my pillow being pulled. I opened my eyes, and I didn't move, but I still felt the pillow being dragged from my head. I froze. I was shocked and terrified. Suddenly, my brother yelled, Hey, wake up! Get out of your room! I snapped out of it, ran and opened my door. There, all six cats were sitting right in front of my doorway, surrounding it. I looked over at my brother and I was about to cry. I ran to him, and before I could even say anything, he told me, don't sleep in there. My cats were never this bothered, and ever since you closed your door, they just sat there. That's usually not a good sign. I felt scared, so I yelled out and called to you. I cried and told him what happened. He believed me. He told me I could sleep in his room for the night, and he'll stay with my grandma, so I did. I never did see what gave me that dreadful feeling in my room, or the thing that pulled my pillow, but I'm glad it's over. As for the lady wearing a black gown, she did disappear when my grandma was getting better. It's been 11 years, Four years ago, my brother passed away, but my grandma did survive cancer, and she's still around.